Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. That sigh of relief is that the legislative session is over and we have that one week collapse before the primaries take it all out of us. So to talk to us about what a great year it was, Kristen Wine from the AP, good to see you again. Thanks for having me. And you know him, you love him, you see him on Fox 31, Eli Stogel. I might be putting it a little kindly, but thanks, John. You see him, you put up with him, yeah. he's on Fox 31. All right, can we, let's start off here. This, this was one boring session. This was, this was the makeup session for how awful things were, were last year. Yeah, they went into it trying to do very little, and they actually did a lot of things. They passed more than 400 bills, so it's not that they did too little, but they did small things. They didn't really pick off big policy things to, to deal with. There were a couple marijuana fixes. They passed the budget. They spread the money around. Steve King got his airplanes to fight fires. You know, everybody, for the most part, could walk away pretty happy. They, they, the one thing they didn't do is come up with a solution on, on oil and gas, on local control, something that would appease Jared Polis, that the industry could live with, something that would get these measures that he's running off the November ballot. Now they're talking about a special session. Kristen and I want to shoot ourselves in the face if that's actually <laughs> something that happens. But, you know, that's the one thing, right? They didn't want to do too much. At the end of the day, there are some Democrats who feel like maybe they could have done a little bit more on that and gotten to that a little bit earlier. Um, because they ran out of time, and I don't know if how, how you it's run out of time this in this point. session. I'm not too certain. I mean, yeah. last last session they realized this is the time to get their big agenda through, and the left did. You know, this was the largest leap towards the left I've ever seen in 40 years in Colorado. And so, the, the governor even managed to veto something. It was a big complaint. My God, you can't lead. You wouldn't even veto a thing. So, it was pretty obvious he needed to veto at least a couple things, and he did. He joked before that he was going to, and a lot of folks would say the reason he hasn't vetoed stuff is because he's really masterful making sure stuff he doesn't like doesn't get to his desk in the first place. But what really surprised me about this session, I thought it would be a reheat of all last session, constantly Republicans reminding voters about the gun package uh, that, voter, that the Democrats put through, reminding them about uh, the near repeal of the death penalty, reminding them about all the kinds of things they want voters to remember. And Republicans put up kind of a perfunctory, I thought, you know, they made the college try on, on repealing things, but didn't make a big thing. You didn't see, you know, airplanes or people driving around honking. So it just kind of like, well, we have to do this, and so let's try to repeal it. Oh, well, it failed. We'll sit here and just smolder till. But the there really isn't a whole lot you can do. When you're in the minority, if you can't get something out of a committee, there's, there's just, there's no place to go, is there? Well, it's not about doing something. It's about telling, reminding folks what the uh, other bad guys are doing, in, in your opinion. So it's about, no matter what the bill is, get up and, and bring an amendment that has nothing to do with the bill, just to get on camera one more time so, and remind folks of the terrible things, the war on rural Colorado, this, or all the things. This you, bill to buy firefighting yes, airplanes exactly. is only necessary because of the attack on the Second Amendment. Exactly. I and like you that. didn't see a lot of that. I'm write so. that one down. That works for, <laughs> all right. But this was also the time where we look forward to to the election year. And in the legislature, there's always some wonderful things that happen when you had um, uh, Brophy taking a run for governor and Amy Stevens running for Senate and others. You know, there's a lot of posturing until those things kind of get, get separated. Did that, did that play out much this year? Oh, I mean, you never heard, there were five state lawmakers who were hoping had aspirations of running for something, none of them are still around. I mean, every, you know, Owen Hill running for Senate, Greg Brophy for governor, Amy Stevens for something, you know, Mark Waller for attorney general, they're all gone, they're all done. And so I, I don't, that's more something that dynamics outside the building than anything that took place during the session uh, as far as why those campaigns didn't go forward. It's hard to run a big statewide race as a state lawmaker. I think sometimes you need a little bit bigger platform. That's why when Cory Gardner got into the Senate race, everybody sort of scattered and said, okay, Go ahead, uh, but it was interesting. I just go back to one thing. Kristen said, you know, the, the day the pre, uh, the session was ending and the governor had us all into his office, they put out a, a sheet and it was three pages, front and back, list of bills. The headline on the bills was 2014 bills to help rural Colorado. They went into this session really aware of the damage they did last year. They tried to repair that. They'll make the argument over the coming months that, hey, look, we 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 understand. We represent the entire. Uh, state, not just Metro Denver and the Front Range, but uh, it's hard. It, it was interesting. The emotions weren't really there. None, there was no Wait, how fight. Do, how, do you this, mean, how do you mean the emotions? There was there? just well, last year, you know, last year Republicans didn't win those bills, but as Kristen said, they won on the politics. They had the crowds. They had the you know emotion. They had the animosity from the opponents. They had recall elections that that bore that out. This year, 
when they br they brought the gun bills back, and it was perfunctory. It was really kind of half-hearted because as as strongly as people still feel, we didn't see it. There were no crowds at the Capitol. The people who actually mobilized and and won on the politics this year were the Democrats. They brought in person after person, victim of a Aurora theater, sh a relative of an Aurora theater shooting victim, people like that, and they went on and on and on pressing their points, not because they needed to, they had the votes to begin with, but they made their point this year. So a lot of those sort of emotional things we saw last year fizzled pretty quickly, and you do have to give the Democrats some credit. Morgan Carroll, Republicans gave her credit, uh, they wanted to tear her head off at times, but at the end of the day, they did give her credit for going out of her way, I mean, really bending over backwards to sponsor bills with Republicans. She was a co-sponsor on the air tanker bill. She sponsored a bill with Senator Rivera, who's, you know, who won their seat in the recall and is a you know targeted seat this fall they made it the democrats made it hard for the republicans to really beat their brains in uh, on, on a lot of things because they basically put it on a platter and said do you want to pass this bill we'll let you and so th they played a as, lot as long as nicer it, as long as it was a bill year. that did something very narrowly focused as most of the bills right. this session were right there was nothing nothing large and also when you only have a one vote majority in the yeah, senate big difference. thanks to those recalls that makes that makes a difference, and we're also saying goodbye to some some great politicians. I think about Lois Tottrop, who is not your average Democrat, one of those that that would occasionally flip over and vote with with Republicans on things from smoking to uh, to education to um, um, of course guns. Uh, who else are we are we losing others this year? The, there there seems to be a change since I've been here from. Democrat, rural Democrat, who might be union friendly, but not hardcore progressive. And then over the last several years, that the Democratic Party has become very hardcore progressive, very urban centric progressive. We saw that last year, no matter how they tried to, to soften it this year. And it's, it's a different personality. You, I think it's a consequence of the way how carefully they craft districts now. Almost everybody in the legislature, their danger is not from someone from the other party. Their danger is always from a primary. If I'm a Democrat, my danger is from another Democrat. If I'm a Republican, it's from being accused of being a rhino. So you see a lot of uh, uh, members, and I said, don't blame anybody. Um, I was talking to a, a rural Republican the last night of session, and he said, I don't blame anybody for bringing things that can be considered why are you bring this extreme bill on either side, because you, you're trying to prevent the accusations in the primary that you're too, uh, too centrist and getting along with the other side. Hey, so let's, let's talk about those primaries. Again, I'm always amazed how well-oiled the Democratic primary machine at least seems to be, particularly in, in larger races, whether it's the United States Senate, congressional races, uh, and of course for governor. We, you know, last two times there's been no primary. This time there's no primary. Republicans always have what seems to be divisive primaries. I think the four guys who are running this time for Republican primary, thus far it has been a remarkably clean gentlemanly primary. I'm waiting for that to change in the final month or so. Um, talk to me about the primaries. What, what has surprised you, particularly for governor? Well, it goes both ways. It can help you to clear the decks uh, and make this is our clear nominee, but it can also hurt you as it did Republicans four years ago when they uh, encouraged um, a prominent Senator Josh Penry to get out of the governor's race, clearing the way for this former Congressman Scott McInnes. And then if you trip and then you, who do you have left? You know, you, so it can it kind of hurt you a little bit. So I think there's a little hesitancy to anoint the, just crown the guy, um, who, the guy or gal is gonna be your nominee. Uh, and that there is, I think it does help a party a little bit to have some um, discussion about who the nominee should be, ha see them in debates. Never held a Democrat. Know. You don't need that with the Democrats. You, whether it was Udall before that, or Ben Nighthorse Camel before that, or Ritter before that, and Hickenlooper after that. You know, the, the, the Democrats play that game so much better than Republicans. Um, and, and you're right. You know, when, when one stumbles, you need you need to have that. But would we agree that so far Republicans, at least in the gubernatorial race, have have acted like gentlemen? Yeah, they have. I mean, Tom Tancredo hasn't showed up to debate any of them. Um, so if he were around more and mixing it up, sort of mano a mano, maybe we'd have a little bit more of a combative, feisty primary so far. But none of them raised any money to get on TV, with the exception of Bo Prey, and he's just going up on cable now. So the money really tells you a lot. It tells you that the establishment Republican business community's choice for governor 
is John Hickenlooper because he's got $1.65 million in the bank. These other guys aren't raising squat. So that tells you that there are folks who have a lot of money in this state who are pretty comfortable with that. And I think Republicans, the establishment folks, are hoping for uh, Bob Beaupre to, to, because he'll have the most money at the end of the day. He won't be as distracting as Tom Tancredo. If Beaupre were the candidate, I think, you know, that helps Cory Gardner. Republicans seem really focused on the Senate race. They feel like that is Are, are you telling me that they've the given up on the, on, the, on the governor's race? Oh, I, I'm not saying they've given up on it, but I think, yes, if you talk to people uh, and they're honest with you, they'll say, in the governor's race, we just want someone who can make that competitive, who's not going to embarrass us and drag down the ticket and hurt Cory Gardner. And That's if funny. we get to sounds, the fall... Sounds to me like you're saying they've given up on the governor's no, race. No, but I think if they get to the fall and things, you know, anything can happen, if they're within striking distance of John Hickenlooper this fall, I mean, you know, unemployment today down to 6%. I mean, John Hickenlooper is going to be very tough to beat. The money tells you that right now. But I still think that, you know, a credible candidate can make that a race. Um, but real quick on those other points, the Democrats are good at this. Look at a, a down ballot race like Secretary of State. Jonah Goose, young guy, never run for anything else. They get, all get behind him. You should have seen his, like, announcement when he decided to, to run. Every establishment Democrat in the world was there backing him up. This guy is 30 years old. They got Angela Heron who wanted to run. They told her no way. So they avoid primaries like that. On the other side, you're right. Republicans are very, they're, they're, they, they can't help themselves but, you know, run these other candidates. And, and if you look at the state Senate, that's where we're going to see that, I think, this, this fall. Is the state Senate, there are a handful of seats that could determine which party controls the state Senate next year. It's just a one-seat majority give, the Democrats have. Give me a couple of seats. Well, the seats in Jefferson County right now. I mean, Mario Nicholas has a pretty decent chance uh, to challenge Andy Kerr for one of those seats, but he's got an RMGO guy. Uh, Rocky Mountain gun owners. Rocky Mountain gun owners, who they recruit a candidate. They brought him here, here that they're even paying you know, him to run, basically. He's a paid candidate. Is but he? he's challenging... Uh, he is challenging Mario Nicholas, who, you know, is pro-civil unions and, and a much more moderate Republican. A moderate Republican might beat an Andy Kerr in a general election, but can he win the primary? And that's playing out in different parts uh, of that district. Actually, and so that's, that's where to watch the let's, Republican Let's pick that up, because politics. not only is there that district, and I think it's Tony Sanchez who's yep. running against Mario, and Tony's a great guy, too, and I know him. Uh, the same thing's happening in, uh, uh, um, what was the... Um, um, uh, but, but, no, no, no. Uh, yes, yeah, Zinzinger, the Hudak district. Mm -hmm. yep. So you've got Lang Sias, who would have won last time if the Libertarian didn't pull 5,000 votes away, mostly from the Republican. He lost by only a few hundred 300 votes. 300 votes. Yeah. You know, and he's, in, he's in, in a tough primary as well. Talk to me about the primaries, those, those Republican state primaries. Can the Republicans win back the Senate? I think absolutely, and I think you saw them, Democrats and Republicans both acting this session like it would be in Republican hands next year. Um, How so? I don't know. They just didn't seem like it. Maybe this maybe more real, realist, or didn't seem as ambitious. More of an emphasis on hanging on to what they got, but not really trying to. You didn't hear them talk a lot about how they're going to get back uh, Bernie Herpin's seat in Colorado Springs. You didn't hear them talk a lot about how they're going to, to hang on to Kerr and Hudak. You did see them, Kerr and Zenzinger now, you did see them give them, uh, let, let them sponsor some pretty prominent bills that they thought would play well in their district. But I wanted to go back to uh, the Republican primary problem, if you want to call it right. a problem. If uh, Cory Gardner knocks off an incumbent senator, which is one of the hardest pulls in all of politics, they'll credit themselves for clearing the deck for him, because he pretty masterfully cleared the deck of uh, some legislators that were seeking that seat. So that could could counter the, they can't clear the decks for the main guy. Let, let, let me go back a few, um, back to the last gubernatorial race, and I had never seen this at least so blatantly done when uh, there was the more establishment candidate of Scott McGinnis in a primary for the gubernatorial candidate with an unknown Dan Mays, who was a Tea Party favorite and nobody knew about him, but he gave a that great speech. That might be generous. Tea Party favorite. I mean, <laughs> nobody knew who he was until, you know. Right, until you. But <laughs> what happened was, because of some of the, 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 the stumbles on the McGinnis side, at the last hour, you had Tim Gill and others on the left pour in about $400,000 for TV ads against Scott McGinnis. Now, this was the first time I've ever seen Democrats play 
in a Republican primary to make sure that the guy who they know can would be easy to beat, impossible uh, to lose from, to make sure that he would win. What a great gamble that they played, and it paid off. That you know, if there was a half million dollars well spent by Democrats, it was playing in a Republican primary. And I've never, I mean, that that crosses a line of of kind of the gentlemanly war, rules of politics in Colorado. Might we see the same thing when it comes to that that seat in, uh, uh, with Langsias and Zenger and, and others? Tell, tell and me. it's not new. It might be new that maybe you're hearing about it or that you know about Half it. Half a million but, dollars. But that's parties new. playing in the other party primary. I thought one thing that was really interesting. Again, going back to 2010, um, uh, a Ken Buck comment that got a lot of uh, traction was when he, when someone asked him what the difference between me and between you, Mr. Buck, and Jay Norton. He said, "I don't wear high heels." Kind of, I mean, it was a, it, 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 he was yeah, yeah. yeah, just an offhand comment. Then went on, um, um, and then it was played up, and Jay Norton herself printed up T-shirts with a high heel on it. And what was funny is that video was captured by a, not by her, but by a Democratic operative, and it was kind of like you realize. They're putting this out because they would rather face you now than Ken Buck. Right. So it's not new that the parties play in the other party. Of course, you want to. But that, the that blatantly, guy. that blatantly. I mean, to have a to have a somebody who yeah. tracks somebody's one thing to actually put in ads. Yeah. The eve of 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 the primaries different. Give me give me your thoughts on that. Um, well, I mean, Kristen's right about the tracker. The tracker, not Craig Hughes, won right. Michael Bennett's Senate race. <laughs> yeah. Twenty five year old kid. Um, but I think that you know, in the primaries, I mean. To win a race, the party does need to be together, and on the, the, they have a chance in the Senate side because of the way that broke when Corey got in. There was a realization, you know, Ken Buck said, oh, this might be a better opportunity for me. Amy Stevens said, you know what, I'll take one for the team here because Corey's my friend and he, he can raise a lot more money than I can. Owen Hill even saw the, the you know, light at the end of the day. Took a little time. Took a little time. He'd won a, you know, Tea Party endorsement. I mean, he had a right to feel like he had you know, a right to be in that race. Um, but at the end of the day, there was just an obvious realization that Cory Gardner gives this party the best chance to beat Mark Udall. Nobody else even came close. So I mean, it was so obvious, it was easy to clear the field there. In the governor's race, nobody got out when Bob Beaupre got in. There's not any candidate in that field who you can look at and say, they're going to beat John Hickenlooper, or they're going to make it a really close race with John Hickenlooper. And that's why you have that primary, because all four of those candidates who are there, and even more of them before the assembly who were there, Greg Brophy, they all said, well, I'm not getting out for you or you or you, you know. Right. I, and so they're fighting it out, you know, and, you know, we'll see who wins on June 24th, this primary. Uh, ball could bounce a number of ways. And, you know, that's going to be very interesting because that is high enough up on, on the ballot that that will impact some other races and get a lot of coverage. If these primaries at the state Senate level, they're very important, they'll be overlooked, but they're very important in terms of which party controls the Senate, but they won't have as much of a, you know, impact on the other races as who comes out of that gubernatorial primary. And following what's going on in the fourth to replace Cory Gardner, there, there, there is, there is a wonderfully exciting primary going on there. And I'm, I'm only going to name a few of the folks. Scott Renfro is up there, and of course, uh, Ken Buck, and then uh, a guy named Steve Laffey, who's rather new to the state, but an entrepreneur, was a mayor in a eastern city, and turned some things around. What, what goes on up up there? I mean, that's wild territory. Do do any of you have a have a feel on that? It's hard to, I think one of the things that I struggle with in Colorado politics, it's hard to make too much or enough of assembly. Uh, this is like um, hardcore, uh, really party activists who are not necessarily the same kinds of people that even vote in a primary. So I know uh, State Senator Renfro did very well, surprised a lot of people that he did better than Ken Buck. But I don't know, I have to still think that that is, uh, uh, Ken Buck has run statewide, he's really well known, really liked out there. Um, I think it would be a real upset for anybody else to come out of that primary but him. Yeah, I mean, at Assembly, you know, and that is really, that's a conservative pool of really conservative. Yeah. Renfro got up on stage and he beat Ken Buck up for going back a little bit on personhood. That's what lost Ken Buck the Senate race, right? But, it, but, but in an assembly, it was like, you know, you're not 100% on life and I am. And he won, what, 56 to 44? I mean, it wasn't even close. But in an actual primary that encompasses that entire district, I think Ken Buck has to be the favorite just given his name ID. Um, the establishment, uh, amazingly, is actually behind Ken Buck in this race. There are people telling me, I went to a Ken Buck fundraiser, I never thought I'd be able to say that, and they're going to that because he seems like 
a bit more reasonable to the establishment than Scott, that, that, that Scott Renfro, who's a Dudley Brown guy, who's just a little bit more out there on, as when a social say, when conservative. When you say Dudley Brown guy, for those people who Rocky might Mountain not Gun follow owners. that, that's, you, you, that's the second time you refer to it. What do you mean? Well, Dudley Brown is sort of, you know, the guy behind the curtain when it comes to Republican grassroots politics. He's a lot, he's the guy who runs a lot of these uh, conservative candidates in these primaries um, and and upsets the establishment apple cart because a lot of them win. A lot of his candidates win. He's very good at getting them money. He's very good at making the argument and appealing to those voters early on in the process. When you primary say conservative, voters, you're, assembly you're voters. we're talking about a socially conservative. Social, yeah, his these issues, are not libertarian leading conservatives. These are more socially conservative. Usually, it's anybody who will tell him that they'll do as he says, and then he, the money flows. But um, it's a pretty strong accusation. Well, I mean, I've seen the I've seen the candidate questionnaire. I mean, the candidate questionnaires are you know check off these boxes, and it says you know that you're pledging your loyalty to these principles and to our organization. I mean, Lang Sias had that survey in his hands and said, I'm not filling this out because he didn't want to be owned by you know a political benefactor. So we th we could talk about this for hours. But basically, there are the sort of different sides of the Republican Party. There's that moderate establishment pragmatic side that says we just need people who can get elected and swing races. Dudley runs these guys who are really, you know, true blue conservatives, true red conservatives, I suppose, and he runs them in primaries for safe seats and he gets them elected. There are a lot of them at the Capitol. I mean, it's safe to say that Dudley may have more votes at the Capitol than the Republican minority leader uh, in both in both chambers. So is, is the supposition here that in those, particularly those Jeffco seats, if the, I'm going to use your term, the Dudley Brown uh, candidates win those primaries, is that what's going to let Democrats win? Or are these people that would have chances in a, in a, in a general? They are hoping. Democrats are fingers crossed, hoping that uh, Republicans will nominate somebody that's unpalatable to to middle-of-the-road like voters. Like who? Uh, well, the, the RMGO candidates that are not the ones that party, probably the party officials would like to be the, no, the nominee. But I want to go back to Ken Buck. And one thing that, uh, that is very interesting to me about him uh, that could play, I don't know what kind of role it will play in a primary, and that is his wife. Not a lot of members of Congress have a spouse who's in the state legislature. His wife, Perry Buck, is in the state house. She's a longtime activist in a Republican women's groups, and she, she might have a lot of pull there, too, that people don't really pay a lot of attention to. So I think it'll be interesting both how he plays in the primary and when he's in Congress, how influential and what kind of role she plays because there's so few members of Congress that have a spouse back home in a state legislature. Ah, the dynasty yeah, begins. And exactly. We're going to be the next Bush family of Colorado. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, talk to me a little bit about the initiatives that are that are coming through. You mentioned it at the beginning. Let's bring it over here. If Jared Polis wants an anti-fracking measure on the ballot, it's it's going it's going to happen. Now, there's been this talk of can can we get a, a special session together and we'll work out something that gives more local control but not complete local control the way one of these initiatives and that way we can diffuse the whole situation. What are the chances of a special session happening? I think slim, but I think there's a good reason why oil and gas companies are afraid and it's not Jared Polis alone in his bankroll. It's that it seems to be kind of hard to explain to folks why a liquor store in your neighborhood or a pot shop in your neighborhood has to be a thousand feet from a school and you get to have a meeting where you talk about whether you want it or not and it has to close at seven and things like that but a we have only one statewide rule for oil and gas uh, production and you can't so setbacks or the main kind of sticking point here where the two sides can't seem to come together and the industry just does not want, and they have 500 foot setbacks now, they do not want to go any higher. And I, I don't see a way that they can come together and come up with some kind of solution. And the main reason I think there will be no special session, even if both sides agree and environmentalists are happy and Jared Polis is happy and the oil and gas industry is happy, at the end of the day, you're telling Colorado, hey voters, take it easy. Don't worry your pretty little head about it. We got it all worked out behind closed doors. We don't want you to decide at the ballot box because you've proven what terrible decisions you make. And I, it's hard to sell, you know. I think they could sell that point. I mean, I think when you talk about a ballot measure, that's a pretty blunt instrument to give local communities the power to ban oil and gas development. And it, I mean, and that's what Jared, Jared's, you know, initiative is not about setbacks. A, a special session bill would be about setbacks. Jared's measures would give local communities that the ones that have passed bans already, it would it would basically say that ban can stand. 
local communities have the authority to over, override the state and to determine for themselves whether they want drilling in their area. The oil and gas industry considers that a taking. And, and, and the interesting thing, it does seem like the prospects of a special session uh, are dwindling a bit, but at the end of the day, there are some people in the industry who look at this and say, we can't give up too much. We can't maybe go as far as Jared Polis is going to need for us to get a compromise that gets his bills off the ballot. But there are a lot of people in industry who are nervous about this, his measures being on the ballot because local control polls very well, polls around 70%. And yes, there'll be tens of millions of dollars spent on both sides. Nobody knows which way the ball bounces. But if it passes, that's a far bigger blow to industry in this state than any kind of setback extension that they might come up with. Let's talk, we've only got about a minute and a half. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives that might pop up. The leftover from a couple of years ago, of course, is personhood, the initiative that just won't go away. Now, you've got um, people running away from it, including Ken Buck and Corey Gardner, who first said, no, no this, is a, uh, this is a good thing. Then when they found more of the details, they said, no, no, this isn't for me. How does this thing continue to get on the ballot? It will always get on the ballot as long as they're interested. And I wouldn't say people are running from it. They ran from it a long, long time ago. These are people not interested in, in how uh, this affects the party or how it might affect candidates. They are, they are genuine, I think, uh, very genuine true believers that uh, personhood is something that needs to be in law. They just tap into their church network and get it on the ballot just as easy as they want. That's a guy who puts together initiatives. <laughs> it is not as easy as you want. Yeah. What makes what's so impressive is that they are able to do it with, largely yeah. with a, with a volunteer basis, and that Absolutely. is just no money. That is amazing coordination for, for that time. What else is like? There's a lot of passion. There, that's true. There may be a GMO initiative, um, genetically modified organisms. Um, you yeah. know, food. Fruit, this fruit, is a, food. for foods. There may be something about uh, video poker, I believe, in, in terms of gaming at a racetrack. I mean, there's a few smaller things, but nothing's going to generate the. Uh, the spending that the local that control will. Good time to be a television or radio yeah. station. Thank you and thank you, thank you. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Check out the Independence Institute, independenceinstitute.org, and tell a friend.